big, big companies, from auto companies to Walmart to uh, foot and apparel companies like Nike or Coca-Cola in, in the food and beverage, and many others are, are now not only thinking about this deeply, but imposing standards on all of their suppliers, which can number in the tens of thousands, and making requirements of them to ship them less packaging, less waste, more energy efficient, less toxic products and materials. This does not make them green companies. This makes them, because I don't even know how to define that. We don't have a standard yet for a green company. Uh, and nobody claims them to be green, including these companies. But, but that means that they're, they're looking at both large and small things, and at the scale in which they operate, even small things can have a huge, huge impact. I'll give you just one little story, and there's thousands of these. A few years ago, McDonald's eliminated the embossed golden arches on their napkins. Right? It's a little embossed golden arches. Probably no, no environmental impacts of embossing that. Um, there's no, you know, dot toxic dyes or heavy metals. Maybe there's a little heat used in that embossing process. Uh, but uh, what would happen as a result? Well, it made the napkins 24% thinner, which means they could fit 24% more napkins in a box, 24% more boxes in a, trek, uh, in, a, in a truck or tractor trailer, eliminating the need for shipping by the equivalent of about 100 tractor trailers a year, just from napkins. Now, that doesn't make McDonald's green. They're not green. But the point is that they're doing hundreds and hundreds and thousands of these things, and so are most companies out there. We don't hear about them. They don't talk about them. You'd think that companies doing green things and, and having significant impacts would want to shout this stuff from the rooftops. But these, in fact, every company wants green stories to, to tell. Everybody feels they need to have one. But the reality is that green stories are hard stories to tell for three reasons. First of all, most of them are about doing less bad, right? So if you have a widget and this widget say, hey, this widget has 54% fewer toxics than last year, that's a significant thing from an environmental perspective, but it still means that, hey, we're beating our wife 46% of the time, right? So that's not a very easy story to tell, however impactful it might be. Uh, the biggest reason is, is that a lot of these things have no value to the, to the consumer in terms of the reason that they buy a product. So if uh, Anheuser-Busch or Coca-Cola figures out how to wring out a third of the aluminum in an aluminum can, which they've done over the past uh, decade or so, and if you think of that, consider the environmental impacts of mining bauxite to make aluminum, or the fact that manufacturing aluminum is so energy intensive, it's top, one of the top three or four or five greenhouse gas emitting industries, that's a significant thing from an environmental achievement. But they're not going to put a green seal on bush and bud. That's not why people buy the stuff. Uh, or if, uh, if, if uh, Frito-Lay uh, you know, or McDonald's or, or somebody who makes potato chips uh, you know, sources potatoes from a, a processor that now uses closed loop uh, washing instead of flushing the, the, the rinse water down the drain every time they wash a load of potatoes, they now recycle it and use it over and over, filter it and, you know, and, and, and all of that, uh, saving hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of gallons of water a year. Again, a significant thing from an environmental uh, uh, perspective, but they're not going to put a green label on a holster of fries or a bag of potato chips. Uh, so it's, these are things that you can't always put on a hang tag or a label or a package or an advertisement. But the third reason is that when companies start talking about what they're doing right, they often unwittingly illuminate problems that the public didn't know they had. So a few years ago, I learned that, that Levi Strauss, which at the time was the largest cotton buyer in the world, had started sourcing 2% of their annual cotton by organically. And I thought that was a really interesting story. I called them, I wanted to write about it. And they said, well, we don't want to talk about it. And I persevered, and I knew people there, and eventually I got them to talk with me about it. And of course, one of the questions I asked them was, why don't you want to talk about it? And they said, well, look at it from our perspective. When we go out to tell this story, we have to explain why we're doing this. First of all, that cotton is one of the hardest crops to grow. Uh, incredible in, in, intensity of, of, of pesticides and fertilizers and water. Um, it's very hard to grow. And, 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 and then we have to talk about the impacts of all that, uh, those pesticides and fertilizers and the groundwater runoff and the impact on worker health and safety and how that affects the birds and the trees. By the time we tell that story, we risk our customers saying, so you mean 98% of what you make is bad for people and the planet? 
why only 2%? Why not five? You know, we're going to do campus boycotts so you commit to 10% organic cotton. You could sort of hear that conversation unfolding in the marketplace. And the conversation that unfolded at, at Levi's is, is unfolding every day at big companies, which is to, to basically asking the question, do we do it or do we talk about it or both? And if we talk about it, how do we talk about it?